This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Sharif Abdelkadus. We end today's show by paying tribute to the life and legacy of pioneering singer and actress Lena Horne. She died on Monday at the age of 92. Lena Horne enjoyed a six-decade career singing on six-decade singing career on stage, television and in film. She was the first black woman to be signed to a long-term contract by a major Hollywood studio. She helped to break racial boundaries by acting alongside white entertainers such as Gene Kelly and Mickey Rooney. But she was segregated on screen so producers could clip out her singing when the movies ran in the South. In the late 1940s, she defied segregation policies at up upscale hotels in Miami Beach and Las Vegas by insisting that she and her musicians be allowed to stay wherever they entertained. In the 1950s, she was blacklisted in part because of her friendship with Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois. In 1963, Lena Horne took part in the March on Washington, alongside Harry Belafonte and Dick Gregory. She was part of a group, which included authors James Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry, that met with Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy to urge a more active approach to desegregation. Before we're joined by Lena Horne's biographer, we turn to Lena Horne in her own words. This is from the Pacifica Radio Archives, an interview Lena Horne did with Pacifica Radio in 1966. She was interviewed by Jean D'Alessi at the San Francisco Fairmont Hotel. He asked her to talk about her father. My father was a Negro man who, who uh, to survive, uh, hustled. Uh, and in the sense of hustling and a Negro man, it means that uh, oftentimes if you were educated and able to get a job, the most menial, uh, uh, and that was all you had the opportunity to, a job you had to hold, you didn't want to do that. And you didn't want to work for someone who had less talent, less brains than you. So. You risked your life. You laid your life down on the line. You were a hustler. You worked with, in many times, criminal attitudes. It took a lot of guts. And on the one hand, you chose that rather than have the man make a slave of you. Who is the man? I knew as soon as I said that I shouldn't have without explaining it. The man is the employer, and the man who was usually the employer that uh, offered the Negro man either the right to be a hustler or work for him was usually a white man, a white employer. And this spring-like day in 1966, that patois, the man, yes, continues? Yes, still continues, of course. The man is a sheriff in <laughs> Mississippi. And the man is a cop in Harlem, white. <laughs> could he be Negro? He could be Negro, because even though he's Negro, the man who's the head of his police department is the white man. Lena Horne speaking in 1966, interviewed by Pacifica Radio's Jean D'Alessi. That, courtesy of the Pacifica Radio Archives. For more on Lena Horne's life and legacy, we're joined by James Gavin, a journalist and author. His book is Stormy Weather, The Life of Lena Horne, joining us from Los Angeles. Welcome to Democracy Now! Uh, James, start by responding to this remarkable clip of Lena Horne in 1966 and put it in the context of her life. A thumbnail sketch, sketch of where she was born, how she grew up and became the singer and actress that she was. Well, 1966, the civil rights movement was still white hot, so to speak, and Lena Horne was desperate to find her way within it, even though she came from a history of activists and poets and teachers and intellectuals. That was who her family was, as part of the so-called black bourgeoisie. Uh, a very small uh, minority of, of highly educated, upwardly mobile, cultivated black people around the early part of the century. And uh, Lena Horne came from that intellectual tradition, and she was raised with a fierce sense of social responsibility, enrolled in the NAACP at the age of two. Can you imagine? what kind of a mantle that is to carry. And throughout her entire show business career, 
there was uh, much more for her to worry about than doing a good job. She was a symbol, and that is some pressure to carry through life. In 1966, though, she had just about found a little foothold for herself in the civil rights movement and gotten some people to take her seriously as more than an ex-Hollywood star, a kind of pampered creature of white show business, which is how a lot of people perceived her then. And she was the first African-American woman to sign a meaningful long-term contract with a major studio. Uh, but uh, in the contract, it said she would never have to play a maid. And in her autobiography, uh, she wrote, they didn't make me into a maid, but they didn't make me anything else either. I became a butterfly pinned to a column, singing away in movie land. A lot of that is exaggerated, I have to tell you. Um, it's true that the reason for Lena Horne being at MGM, which signed her in 1942, was that she was a sort of a pawn, as she put it, of the NAACP. The great NAACP leader, Walter White, saw Lena Horne as a tool for revolutionizing the black image in Hollywood. She was beautiful in a way that white America could accept. There was no such thing in 1942 as the phrase, black is beautiful. Lena Horne was beautiful in a more uh, Hedy Lamarr, Rita Hayworth style, very refined ways, uh, Caucasian singing style, Caucasian in a lot of her manner. And um, as for the butterfly pinned to a column remark, which became part of her myth, it's a famous phrase, but there is not a single scene uh, of Lena Horne in any of her films that show her standing next to a column. Lena felt imprisoned because she was not really allowed to interact with white actors on screen. She was presented in these beautifully produced cameo segments by MGM, but, it's, but she wanted much more. Let's turn back to Lena Horne speaking on Pacifica Radio in 1966. Again, the interviewer, Jean DeLessi, asking Lena Horne to talk about her relationship with Paul Robeson. Paul taught me about being proud because I was Negro. I had always had this pride, this fierce sterile, almost, kind of pride, because my grandmother had said, you must be proud, but she never told me all the horror of her background. One didn't talk about it, you see, and then she died, and I was getting more and more in that middle-class trap with uh, uh, Negroes who might have a job who didn't speak about it also. I worked uh, even at the time I was uh, 16 and with Cecil, with organizations, but he never told me the reasons why I had a right to some of that pride, you see. But Paul was the first one who came to me and said, your grandmother was a fiery little woman who chased me off the street corners of Harlem, and she was this and she was that. I said, really, nobody ever told me that. He said, why, she was a wonderful Negro woman because she wanted to help her people and she felt she had a right to it. And she made uh, this expression, noblesse oblige, mean being proud of her people. And I said, but no, nobody ever said it. And he sat down for hours and he told me about Negro people and what, you know, I read it in some books and never learned it in school. They don't teach it in history books. I couldn't know anything unless I really uh, had moved up by then from the South and had been with Negro people who were terrified, you know, and couldn't do anything about it. And he didn't talk to me as a symbol of a pretty Negro chick singing in a, a club. He talked to me about my heritage. And that's why I always loved him. And I didn't even know, he didn't even speak to me as a leader, quote, Negro leader. And so uh, I grew to think then about all the, all the areas of it. And Josh taught me about 
singing about it, and I couldn't sing, you know, and I was fighting that kind of invert chauvinism from white people who said, well, she can't sing the blues, you know, and so I felt embarrassed. But 